All right, welcome everyone to our second ever webinar for the BOHS Midlands region. I'm Mary Cameron, your organizer. Uh, thank you all for taking the time out to attend. Uh, we have two fantastic topics covered today. First up, we'll, we will have Gareth Evans presenting on metalworking fluid. Gareth is the technical lead for the HSC's research program on working safely with metalworking fluid. Uh, he will be discussing good practice management, the recently revised UKLA good practice guide, and new technology to characterize biological hazards and for um, monitoring air quality in machine workshops. Uh, then we will lead into Howard Mason's presentation on seafood allergens. Uh, there was a recent HSC bulletin on occupational asthma in seafood processing, I'm sure you all will be aware of. Howard works as a HSC principal scientist and reviewed the risk of occupational asthma to workers employed in the seafood processing industry. Um, his discussion today will include the risk to health via inhalation, allergic proteins and air sampling methods and exposure data. So we're in for quite a treat, a lot to cover today, very interesting topics. Um, as we go along, please do submit your questions and we will have a Q&A &A session at the end. Uh, so right now I'm going to hand, hand over to Lee from the BOHS who will walk you through some of the logistics for GoToWebinar. Thank you very much, Mary. Yep, so um, just on the right-hand side of your screen there, it should be uh, nice and simple. There should be a box to ask a question. Um, if you just type in any point during the webinar or when we kind of finish the presentations at the end, uh, feel free to ask your questions and we'll get through as many as we can. Any that we don't get through to, we will forward on to our panelists today and um, their answers can be included with the recording of the webinar to all of the attendees today. Um, also, just want to say a quick uh, apology. Our email system was a bit uh, funky this morning. So apologies if you got a few blank emails there, but hopefully, obviously you've all received the email, otherwise you wouldn't be here now. So um, just a quick, um, quick note there, but um, I will pass us over now to our first uh speaker of the day who is gareth so gareth you should be able to share your screen now can you see that all right excellent yep you just full screen that and you're good to go good well welcome everybody um uh, thank you mary for the introduction and uh, what i'm planning to do today is just summarize some aspects of the work that we're doing on metal working fluids uh, particularly with respect to preventing occupational disease i think it's important before i start just to acknowledge my colleague jody brooks who's a very clever molecular biologist and um, some of the work that she's been introducing into our program of research i'll be covering later when it comes to understanding and identifying uh, the role of bacteria particularly in water miscible metal working fluids um, so what i want to do today is to try and summarize uh, what we know about metal working fluid as a cause of occupational disease again discuss some of the concerns about specific hazards and exposure circumstances or risks I then want to bring us on to what HSE is doing, particularly focusing on the partnership work that HSE has put in place, because this is a really quite complex problem and it cannot be solved alone. We need a variety of perspectives and expertise to make sense and to move forward with interventions that will hopefully reduce the burden of ill health. And then finally, I want to come on to some areas of emerging research uh, that I've touched on, particularly Jody and others are involved with. I think like many other occupational health problems and going back to Koch principles, um, it's very important that we focus on particular approaches to the risk that might be presented by work with metalworking fluids. And rather like the Koch principles, the approach we've adopted over the last 10 years since the very large outbreak of ill health occurred at the powertrain plant is first to look at how we manage the quality of metalworking fluid. So think of this rather like the start of our Koch hierarchy and we have a more hazardous chemical. We ask ourselves the question, can we replace this with a less hazardous chemical? And the case of metal working fluids, they are what they are, but the question is, is the way they're managed is what actually dictates the hazards that might be associated with their use. And so the first question is that we put a lot of focus into is, are people managing the quality of those to minimize the risk at the start of the whole process? <clears throat> 
It's clearly important as well to minimize exposure to metalworking fluids, whether that come from contact in relation to the onset of dermatitis, or whether it's inhalation, both to miss aerosols, fumes. What are the sources? What activities might contribute towards that? And what can we do to reduce that? But when we're talking about minimizing exposure to metalworking fluids, we're also thinking about the appropriate control processes that should be put in place. And how do we know that they're effective? And to know that they're effective, there's an important element of measurement. And that is one of the problems that we still have with metalworking fluids, particularly in the UK, which I'll touch on. One of the things that's certainly been made clear from doing the research, given the complexity of machining equipment, the many different types of workshops you'll find from the very most modern with state-of-the-art equipment, but the more typical older building workshop with a mixture of new and old equipment, some cutting at low speed, some at high speed, some not enclosed, some partly enclosed, some fully enclosed, is still the question, what are the practical means to actually manage these control systems? And do we need to do more to influence the future of the design of machines and operation of control systems? So when we're thinking about the routes of exposure to metalworking fluids, this could be by all three routes. Clearly skin contact, we know that dermatitis has been and continues to be a problem with people using metalworking fluids. The risks of inhalation we've touched on, but there is also the potential when people are breathing in an environment like this, or perhaps touching their hand to their face, of an element of ingestion as well. And to a certain extent, whatever you inhale will be brought up by the mucociliary pathway and again can be ingested. So what are these various routes? One of the things that's becoming apparent is that we need to perhaps rethink our understanding of this problem. It is such a complicated situation that gives rise particularly to the respiratory disease that we're seeing. And this is, I'm largely talking about respiratory allergy. And of course, historically, we've tended to focus in an occupational circumstance on an individual who's become ill, asking sensibly what it is they were doing. Uh, what were they doing wrong? Were the controls working for them? But I think as we begin to understand more about respiratory disease in machinists, the more it's becoming clear that we need to open our mind up to other possibilities. And that is that whilst we see the individual and often focus in the individual, we might here be dealing with a circumstance where the many are exposed, but some become ill. And that's either because of predisposing risk factors, you know, they're genetically predisposed, they have a history of illness that predisposes to them, and so thinking about that and trying to understand that can really open up perhaps some of the avenues that we should take in future for our research. Uh, briefly, what are metalworking fluids? Well, I can only give a brief survey here, but essentially there are different types from neat or straight oils. Um, in the past, these were associated with concerns, particularly for things like skin and scrotal cancer, but this was largely to do to a lot of contaminants from the poorer quality of the oils or also as they were in use. And that's less true of the modern highly purified oils today. We then have a mixture of soluble oils um, consisting of um, semi-synthetics or completely synthetics. And, and essentially in, in those fluids, you get a range of additives, particularly in water miscible metal working fluids, where it's necessary to prevent the growth of microorganisms, a number of biocides are being used and added. Uh, it's important to preserve the quality of metal surfaces. So you have things like corrosion inhibitors. You have surfactants. You have anti-foaming agents. There's a whole variety of things that will go into a metal working fluid, which have the potential to cause some effects in individuals who are exposed, particularly when you're thinking of things like biocides. And of course, then we have to think about the fluid in use. That may be the fresh fluid. But as it becomes used, and in big multi-machine single sump systems, and in powertrain they had sumps, you know, with about 20,000 litres in, those sumps often will be kept simply because of the sheer expense of the fluid for a very long period of time. So as the fluid builds up through aging process, it will accumulate lots of other contaminants, things like tramp oil that might come from leaks on seals on the machines, microorganisms, 
um, even material extraneous to the sump system where you have lots of open channels. And so this is the problem. It's evolving with time. And the history has been often the larger the sump systems, the longer people will seek to keep that fluid in operation. In terms of risk to health, I've already touched on them. But clearly, as you can see on the left hand side here, occupational dermatitis is a significant problem. A lot of this is an irritant type of dermatitis because people are touching wet surfaces. They're handling often components. Um, there is a risk also that when people use compressed air lances, compressed air guns, and I'll show you later some pictures, that the actual metal working fluid sprays back onto their body, onto their hands. And so there's a significant risk if people have got their hands constantly wet. And there's a tendency, particularly in the past, people just say dry their hands with rags and cloths, which might themselves also be contaminated. We can't discount also the risk for allergic dermatitis. This can come from some of the biocides, which are known sensitizing, contact sensitizing agents. But also if we think about the types of metals that people are actually machining, much of which can also solubilize to an extent in the metal working fluid or are present as very tiny ultra fine particles which present on the skin can get into sores and cracks in skins and so on so there is the potential as well in some individuals to develop allergic contact dermatitis in terms of lung disease the two reasons we've been mainly encountering is occupational asthma and occupational hypersensitivity pneumonitis um, both of these are related, we believe, to responses to biological agents, but in the case of asthma, also likely to be from chemical sources as well. And when we look at the occupational hypersensitivity pneumonitis, it's clear that whilst uh, in other circumstances, other occupational circumstances, this can be caused by certain organisms like, say, mycobacteria, it is more complex and I'll touch on this in a second when I deal with some of the health related research that we've done. Um, you'll all be aware that in around 2005 we had to deal with this very large outbreak, um, one of the largest that's occurred internationally, uh, an investigation that involved several hundred workers, at least a hundred mm -hmm. had definable respiratory disease, and this has all been published. Uh, it led to a systematic review by my colleague, Chris Barber, and, and ourselves, which really looked at some of the circumstances might account for outbreaks of respiratory disease. And as I said, there has been a focus in more recent work, even in the UK, on the possible involvement of mycobacteria, although people aren't yet agreed whether it's one type of mycobacteria or several other types. And this certainly came from early work that was done around the 90s and 2000 by NIOSH in the United States, where again, they had identified mycobacteria as potentially involved in the development of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Uh, the one thing that came out of the study from Powertrain is that it took many years to unpack all the data and the information that was collected at that. But of 808 uh, workers in the end that were interviewed and taken through a brief screening questionnaire to look at their respiratory uh, health and um, skin disease, what was clearly as they moved through a triage of questioning and um, tests, at the end of the day, it was decided with the initial study that about 19 individuals had evidence of allergic alveolitis. It's called EAA back then, but uh, we've tended to adopt the occupational hypersensitive pneumonitis definition now that's more internationally used. And about 74 cases of occupational asthma. Chris Barber and his colleagues uh, and a group of clinicians who are experts in this area actually then went through all that evidence later and developing and applying gold standard criteria and decided in the end that of those 19 that originally thought there was only really good solid evidence for about 12 individuals having OHP but with about another seven individuals who had some symptoms consistent with that but also symptoms of occupational asthma and then there were about 74 cases of occupational asthma and others with um, humidifier fever. <clears throat> 
the one thing that came out of their study, and this also includes when they looked at the patients with occupational asthma, is the complexity of the respiratory disease in these individuals. It was less easy to put them into nice tight little boxes, say hypersensitive pneumonitis and asthma. And this did suggest that their disease was being driven by this complex set of circumstances when people are inhaling combinations of chemicals and mixtures of proteins and so on. And so we need to recognize that this disease has a really complex etiology. And that is probably one of the reasons when we've looked at all the outbreak investigations, it's often very difficult to predict where they will occur. And although we've gone through many of the ones that have been published, often the circumstances look different. There's an element of which is unpredictable. And you might go from just a few individuals with respiratory disease right, and then into a situation like powertrain where we have nearly 100 individuals with serious respiratory disease. And the important thing coming out of that study is that really we felt duty holders need to recognize these risks. There is uncertainty about what's causing it, but it's clearly occurring. There is the risk there, so what do we do to promote that? And part of that also is a greater focus in future in promoting awareness about the need for occupational health surveillance. Clearly with asthma and allergic alveolitis, these are serious diseases, debilitating diseases, can shorten the life in certain individuals. And the question is, are duty holders aware of that risk and taking the appropriate actions to put in place the proper measures? If we think now about the hazards in metal working fluids, I've already mentioned microorganisms, but a lot of organisms, including things like gram-negative bacteria, can produce toxins like endotoxin, which I'm sure you'll have all heard of. And endotoxin itself, whilst it wouldn't explain why people are developing asthma or hypersensitive pneumonitis, it certainly can be a cofactor. In the, in the risk of people developing those conditions. Endotoxin, for example, in very tiny concentrations, will promote an inflammatory response in the airways, which will include congestion of the airways. In some individuals, breathing difficulties, if people have a pre-existing respiratory condition, it can exacerbate them. We also know it interplays when you're exposed to antigens and therefore may increase certain individuals' risk of developing an allergic response. Uh, in older types of fluid, there was a lot of concerns, again, with bacteria being present about nitrosamines and their role as potentially carcinogenic agents. Uh, we've talked about the biocides being added and, and all the other things that are present and the dissolved metals and particularly the metal fines. And as you can see in these pictures here, uh, the top one on the left hand side, that sludge is what we call biofilm. Um, if you let your system go too far, uh, as can often happens with many uh, su water supply uh, systems, you will get a buildup, a growth, a film of organisms. It forms a unique ecosystem. <clears throat> it allows certain organisms to thrive in that that might not thrive in suspension in the fluid, including hazardous pathogens. So this itself can then seed the whole system. And unless you clean a system effectively, remove that, you can have problems. Uh, the picture on the right hand side is an example of the accumulated metal fines that you can pull out the bottom of tanks. But a lot of this, the smaller particles, is constantly circulating, can act to metabolically help bacteria and promote the growth. The bottom picture shows an example where tramp oil has got out of control and you can see the brown material floating on the sump surface. And the presence of tramp oil itself can actually act to stimulate and act as a growth substrate for microorganisms. So if we look at the microorganisms, on the left hand side is a picture of a dip slide or several dip slides. It's a montage of them. This is what's typically used or we'd expect people to use for checking the growth of microorganisms in their fluid. The top set of panels in that sort of orangey color with the little red spots being bacteria. Uh, the bottom left hand panel, the pink ones, but clear little round spots are yeast. And the ones on the right, uh, not so clear as spots, but that's typical of fungi growing out all over the place. Uh, um, and these are all things that can actually grow in metal working fluids. And not all bacteria are harmful. And some may actually be in some ways protective. And we know that in terms of the many bacteria that grow inside our body. Some will outcompete the growth of hazardous organisms and could potentially be beneficial. But the problem is there are undoubtedly certain types of bacteria 
and fungi, and potentially yeast, which are very good at promoting allergic responses in the airways. And this is what we have to be concerned about and where we really need to get a better grip to understand where the hazardous, perhaps organisms may lie, and what more we can do to prevent them growing in metalworking fluids. It has to be said that with a conventional water miscible metalworking fluid, it is not easy to prevent the growth of microorganisms when you have a partially open system and you're maintaining that for weeks to months. It is always going to be a challenge. In terms of endotoxin, which I've already mentioned, people ask a lot of questions about this. As more organisms grow in a metalworking fluid, they will go through a cycle of living and dying back and growing again. You might add biocide in there to control their growth. And whilst you reduce the amount of living organisms, essentially what you do by killing many of those, you release the endotoxin. So with passage, if you're adding biocide too much, it's also contributing to a type of biofouling where endotoxin builds up. This is just a brief summary of some data we did a few years ago where we looked at many of the published studies that had reported endotoxin measurements. On the left-hand side, endotoxin in the bulk fluid in the sump. On the right, when personal sample had been done, on the operator close to where that machine was obviously fed by that sump. I want you to ignore to a certain extent the bottom axis which says low, medium and high because we went through those studies and actually evaluated the quality of the studies as well. I just want you to stand back and look at the overall picture and that is that when you look in the sumps, this is on the left hand panel, you'll see that on average most of the end sumps had endotoxin levels that were high from around 10,000, maybe 1,000 units, but sometimes almost as high as 100,000 endotoxin units per mil. So we've always been concerned about that. We've known that. But on the other hand, when you look at the published evidence on the right-hand side and you look, the actual levels in the air are very low. In fact, that red dotted line marks the Dutch DCOS committee's work which defined a health-based recommended occupational exposure limit for endotoxin around 96 endotoxin units per cubic meter of air. So you can see actually what we're measuring in some circumstances exceeds that, but is not that much greater than it. So is this a bit of a, an area of uncertainty? Are we seeing that much endotoxin getting to the air? This is an area that we need to really come back to and do more. The one thing I would note though is that the Hebrol, um, studies that they used to define that 96 endotoxin units, they had to exclude people who were most at risk, such as asthmatics and others. So to a certain extent, it probably represents the threshold response in individuals who are more healthy rather than those with pre-existing disease. There's also been concerns, given the amount of um, you know, volume of water and the storage of this water-based emulsions about the risk for Legionella. And so many years ago, we were asked to look at this and at the time used the best available uh, DNA based methods, a sensitive specific polymerase chain reaction for Legionella uh, amongst a range of samples from different workshops, but were unable at that point to detect many copies of Legionella in used fluid of a range of ages and types of fluid. Another test we did is that you may not be aware that Legionella doesn't grow on its own. It actually grows, and that's the picture on the right, within an amoeba, such as Acanthamoeba. And that's where it's able to proliferate and burst out, releases more Legionella, which again, and this tends to happen in biofilm where the amoeba lives. So we tested the ability of those amoeba hosts or the amoeba with the Legionella in them, or a Legionella on its own, to survive in a range of metalworking fluids, but found that they didn't survive for longer than a few hours. Now, this doesn't mean there's no risk of Legionella growing, and some of the new work we're doing is beginning to hint at possibilities that some systems may have very, very low levels. So we need to keep our eye on this. But on the whole, it did suggest that whilst there may be a risk with stored water systems, the nature of metalworking fluid was more likely to restrict the growth of Legionella in those systems. And then moving on, what are the exposure risks? Well, some of them are very obvious, particularly with high-speed machining. There's been a lot of research done, by, particularly by Tina Reepinen's group in America, which has shown that as you increase machining speeds, not only the number, but the size of the droplets shifts very much to the left towards respirable, 
and ultrafine droplets, particularly over speeds around one and a half to 2,000 RPM, you get this big exponential. And that's consistent with the results we found when HTC asked us to look into this to see whether very low speed cutting machines present a risk. And it's largely that they're producing droplets that will fall out. And whilst guarding and some degree of measure from protecting the operator from being exposed to those droplets is important, the risk of inhalation from fine uh, droplets and particles is much less. But it's not the only activity. Compressed air lances are used an awful lot for cleaning work. And we showed in a study, started off in the picture you see in the middle using a mannequin and using fluorescent dyes, the picture on the right hand side, that in fact, when you use a compressed air gun, particularly when you use it at typically the five to six bar pressure that many operators will set them at, you again generate very, very large numbers of very fine, ultra fine particles. You can get splash back onto the operator, as you can see. So even the large droplets are falling onto the operator and often unrecognized if you're doing this a lot. And in the lower picture, you'll see some backlighting. And again, you can see the sort of mist that's generated from this. So this is something, again, that's of concern because it's widely used in terms of risk. So let me move on now to the research and the activities. Well, HSC has been funding research in this area since the powertrain event in 2005. What I want to emphasize, it's very collaborative. It can only work because we're working with industry trade bodies like the UKLA, and more recently, we've been having discussions with Manufacturing Technologies Association in Amada, those people involved with obviously engineering control equipment. Um, and that is really very critical. Uh, another partner is the Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre in Sheffield. We'll have a big programme looking at the future technology for metalworking fluids. I'll say a bit more about that later. We have an internal technical forum. Uh, Fiona McGarry from Manufacturing and Transport Sector Unit leads on a lot of the work that we're doing here as the sort of owner or end user of what we're doing to make certain what we do is going to help the inspection enforcements and guidance processes. But we've got colleagues, Sam Lord, Paul Smith, Duncan Smith, Robert Williams from the Specialist Occupational Hygiene Unit, bringing their knowledge in. Chris Barber at the labs, who's the Deputy Medical Officer um, and a consultant, an NHS consultant at Respiratory Medicine in Sheffield, Jody Brooks, um, Jody Brooks and myself. <clears throat> What is our focus? Well, I've mentioned it's partnership with other experts and end users of metalworking fluids. We're very much focusing on the quality management of fluids. It's about trying to reduce the exposure to metalworking fluid mist and aerosols. A big challenge is how we quantify exposure to metalworking fluid mist. And more recently, we're now moving that program to look at working with others on how can we influence the future design of machine tools, ensuring that mist extraction and LEV is appropriate? We're beginning to look at new ways to understand microbial growth in metalworking fluids and trying to get a better understanding of air quality as an issue. And all of that is feeding through not only to information we try to um, circulate to duty holders in partnership with others, but also in terms of HSC guidance and keeping that up to date. Talking about fluid quality, many of you will be aware of this. Um, about three years ago, after several years of work with the UK, UKLA, the UK, uh, sorry, the UK Lubricants Association and their product stewardship group, we brought groups of experts together to try and develop a life cycle approach to using a metalworking fluid managing its quality. It was aimed at workshop supervisors. And the first version, which came out about two years ago, was distributed via the UKLA website. Um, of 2,000 copies were given out by companies to their um, supply chain. It's on the website and it's also linked at the HSE website. We've now just issued the second version, and that second version has tightened up particularly some of the information and advice about occupational health provision. It's tightened up some of the mistakes you often make in a, a document like this. Um, they were fairly small, but they were important to avoid misunderstandings. And that can now be downloaded at that address you can see there. Our colleagues in France uh, from the Syndicate of National Lubricants is just in the process of translating the second version. 
Um, obviously, removing some of the UK specific regulatory guidance and a similar body in Italy has plans to also translate this into Italian. And through the occupational research network called Paroche, uh, we're also uh, getting our colleagues in other European countries to look at this with a view where they need to, perhaps also to make use of this. What does the UKLI guide do? Well, I'm just going to touch briefly on what it is. It starts off really focusing on these message about understanding the risk to health, about the risk of inhalation and prolonged skin contact, and what you should do and what measures you should put in place, particularly understanding the requirement for occupational health surveillance. It's got a lot of technical tips and advice. We wanted to, it to be very visual to explain things so that a supervisor could even use this perhaps in training with apprentices. And there was enough visual there to help guide people through what they should be looking. An example being on the left, a simple measure for pH to look at the quality of the fluid, how you determine the concentration using a refractor, the panel in the middle, or how you undertake dip slides and what you should be looking out for. A little bit fuzzy, these images, but if you look certainly on the one on the left-hand side, the, the, the guide also has tables of actions, things you need to be thinking about doing to check the fluid quality, why you should do that, suggested how frequently you should do that, and always emphasize the importance of keeping records of these. And so you have examples here, such as on the left-hand panel, a lot more information when you're interpreting depth slides about what those thresholds of concern are and what are the actions you should take on that. A middle panel showing exactly the actions table for how you maintain the flow of your system in relation to cleaning, in relation to design points. And again, on the right, the example of checking the pH. So that's what that's aiming to do. Um, the panel that's working on that is also doing other things to try and promote awareness. So we just recently ran with the Chemical Hazard Society a webinar, which I think we ended up with 269 people attending the full uh, hour or two of that, which had a detailed discussion session, and we're running more of those events. And that's looking to get knowledge of the guide out as far as possible. And there are some plans to produce a simplified pocket version of this guide as well, that we'll be able to put in sort of operatus overalls that will also tell them the basic do's and don'ts. Uh, moving on now, if we look at this question about how we'd re reduce exposure to metal work in fluid mist, I mentioned years ago that we did this work, um, particularly using uh, a number of direct reading aerosol monitors to monitor what impact the use of compressed airline has on generation. If you look at the top panel on the uh, left hand side, it shows you a range of droplet sizes, the different colors there. Uh, the ones that are at the top, the dark blues being the very smallest um, respirable size. And on the right hand side, you can actually see what happens when you move up to about five or six bar. And you can see that very big increase. And again, we've seen these pictures before. Interestingly, the picture where we use fresh and dyes to demonstrate deposition, we had a full size poster of this at one of the big Mac events, and that drew in a huge amount of interest and started lots of conversations. And it just demonstrates the power of visual evidence sometimes, rather than lots of numbers, as you see above, to raise awareness and start discussions. Well, we wanted to move forward on the base of what we knew to truly try and better understand why are people using compressed alliance and what were the other options. So back in 2019, we ran a workshop at the AMRC with lots of different participate, participants and industrial hygienists, including people who had experience of using alternatives to compressed airlines. And uh, we're hoping this is going to get published. It's been delayed a little bit because many of us are now the last eight, nine months involved with COVID, but that will be coming out soon. And that really summarized. And what was valuable is that we did really understand at the moment that there are not really very good alternatives to fine surface cleaning. But what everybody agreed is that we need to find ways that when compressed air is used, that people do use it at lower pressures where they possibly can to reduce that, to use different designs of compressed air lances that can minimize the exposure and splash back to make certain that's done as much as possible within closed spaces where the air can be extracted, and then to promote the whole range of other methods where people often fall back on using compressed airlines without thinking and realizing that there are 
often better methods for removing bulk materials and, and larger volumes of fluid and cleaning machines. And so it's been a combined strategy to try and promote all those other methods to minimize the reduce and ensure that when compressed airlines are used, they're again done under more carefully and strictly controlled conditions. And we need to build on that. What about quantifying exposure to mist? This has always been challenging. And since the powertrain event, HSC had to withdraw its guidance value based upon MDHS 95.3 for the boron based marker, which was set at a milligram, because the company where that had happened, the average levels were less than this. And it suggested it clearly wasn't protective of the risk to ill health. Um, Many of the countries have maintained their exposure uh, limits, often based upon gravimetric or a combination of chemical analytical and gravimetric methods. And we still have in place the methodologies, the boron-based one and the neat oil method. But the concern is that with the restriction, planned restriction on the use of boric acid in lots of substances, including metal working fluids, that's now driven to many fluid manufacturers to remove boron salts from their fluids so the value of that as an analytical market is going away from us so one of the things we also did back um, about two years ago on the basis of research that we did for ukulele looking at whether direct reading aerosol monitors might have a value not as a true quantitative measure because they can't do that but as a qualitative assessment that might help people detect leaks do quick relative checks before and after replacing a filter in LEV system and so on, whether they would have a value and what were the risks in doing that. And so we held another workshop at the AMRC, including talks about what we knew about the latest, often relatively inexpensive DRAM devices. They can even cost a few hundred pounds, up to high-end ones costing 5,000 pounds. And again, the outcomes of that are all published and you can see the URL on the right-hand side under that picture of the workshop report. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but again, what that found is, just as I've stated, these should not be used as a quantitative measure. There's still a lot of uncertainties about their use. But what we did find is that their use can be practical for quick checking, but the workshop participants also recommended that people should consider using simple methods like backlighting and other ways to generate, such as smoke pencils and so on, ways of visualizing leaks or seeing flow of air that would be suitable and practical even for the smallest workshops. And we ought to be encouraging people to get behind that so that they had a better awareness of where there were problems and leaks occurring. The more recent thing we've been doing is the concern about particularly the design of machines, even some of the latest CNCs. It almost seems, and we're told this by many machine operators, that the point in design where you'd extract the air is almost the last thought. And we know many workshops have a range of different machines, including often open machines, which have to be because of the way they move or the large format that they work on. And so to try and get some better answers to what the options might be, over the last year and a half, we've started discussions with the Manufacturing Technology Association and IMADA to see what possibility there may be to influence design standards, to get more conversations going between machine operators, the large companies that often buy many of these machines and, have, and can bring influence to what machine manufacturers do, as well as the, the simple stuff we can do at the lower end, what more can we do to improve the design and operation of these machines? Let me move on to some of the new areas of research. Microorganisms are a problem, but there's a big problem historically with the way we've examined them. The problem is that we take organisms from a fluid that have been growing that for a long time, and we try and grow them in cultures on agar. And we know that only about 10% of the organisms in an original sample are capable of when you shock them growing in that environment. So you're never really seeing all of the organisms that are in that metal working fluid. And when you do see, say, viable organisms in there, the likelihood is, just because the nature of the growth and death, you know, the growth and death cycle, is that probably 90% of the total organisms in there are dead. And that's what our immune system is seeing. Our immune system is responding generally to the proteins. It doesn't matter whether the organism's alive and dead. So that's a potential problem. And 
Also, organisms like mycobacteria, which we are concerned about, are not easy to grow. And so you may be missing them from your analysis. And whilst dip slides are a practical means to quickly check, they're very biased to the organisms that will grow readily and speedily. So we could be missing an awful lot. So based on that concern, we begin to think about how we can better assess what's not only growing in the fluid, but do you actually inhale some of these organisms? And again, the problem is conventional personal and static sampling with low volume samples and with filters is insensitive. There are problems of recovery from those filters. And even conventional impingers working at slow flow rates can also have a problem, even with bubbling air through them. So very recently, we started to look at a new type of sampler called a Coriolis sampler, which is high volume based on a cyclone unit that impacts things into a 15 mil buffer sample. And we just in the early days, and I'll show you some of the results we're getting with that. It's not perfect, but it is one of the devices that can allow us to grab a lot more air quickly to produce it into a convenient medium that will promote survival of the organisms and allow us to take that through. So what else can we do to improve our knowledge? If we can't see more than 10% by culture, and it's a biased view, what can we do? Well, the answer is we can extract the genetic material from a fluid sample, not play around with it, take what's there, and using genetic methodology, we can begin now to identify a far wider range of organisms. And so we recently brought into, and we work with people in Manchester University on this sequencing approach for microorganisms. We have a thing called the MySeq system, and that's particularly good for uh, sequencing DNA from microorganisms. And I won't go into it, but basically you take a particular region that's common in many organisms. This is the 16S ribosomal RNA, but where each species will have variations in that. And then you take that smaller segment of DNA and you sequence it. And then basically using software and lots of clever databases, you can work out all the species that are present. And I'm just going to give you very briefly some examples. If I can just show you this pie chart, but looking on the right hand side, that is a metal working fluid in a factory where they had ill health. But it's a, a, an old sample of metal working fluid before biocides added to it. And often when we use conventional microbiology, we might just see this large part of the pie chart pseudomonas species and one or two other. But now when you're using this method, you see the range of organisms that are present. Why? They actually form a microbiome. Those organisms, though they might be present in low abundance, could well be forming a, an environmental niche that allows certain organisms to grow in them. So understanding these niches is important to understanding the risks for certain types of organisms. Interesting on the left-hand side, in this factory where they had ill health, we had found a lot of the systems just had mycobacteria in them. And that was a concern. But it's very interesting that when the biocide is added, despite biocide being added, you can now see how species poor this is, except for mycobacteria. It's what you might predict. Most of the organisms were killed, but mycobacteria, which are much more resistant to many biocides, weren't. So to a certain extent, whilst we need people to use biocides, we still have to be thinking carefully about their impact on what happens. Here's another example, applying this to those air samples collected using the Coriolis. For the first time, we can start to see a whole range of organisms in the air. The thing is, they could be in the air because they've come from many other sources. But what we were able to show is that when you map those organisms in these two pie charts, but you look at the bulk fluid, what's in it, and you look at the air, in the middle of that pie chart is a common area where we're seeing many organisms in the air sample close to the machine that could only come from the metal working field. I'll pick one example. The Cornobacterium lubricantis is a specific species known and identified to grow in metal working fluids. So using this technique, we're beginning to move closer to saying if you mismanage your fluids, if you have this growth, what's in there can get in the air. What can we use this for? Well, we can use it for identifying pathogens. It can help us understand how the formulation of the fluid and the life cycle use of it affects the growth. It can tell us about the impact of biocides. And we're hoping more of this will be done in a new program of research at the AMRC called the Flight Fluids ATA Sprint Study, which Matt Broderick is involved, but will involve many partners. Briefly now, I just need to say about air quality. 
we've started to think about what air quality looks like in workshops using a new type of sensor that can pick up lots of particulates as well as gases as largely being designed for outdoor use, but we began to explore its use indoor. And these monitors were placed in a workshop, a busy workshop where there were three shifts and basically we were able to do monitoring for months in different places where there might be exposure, to heavy exposure like in, uh, in the workshop compared to the offices. The top shirt part, shirt part shows this continuous readout over a long period of a week, ignore the bit in green because that's when the sensor was in one of the workshops, but then moved into a non-machining area. And you can see that there's some variations for PM10 particles, they're all generally down about 10 micrograms. But in the workshop below, you see these heavy peaks of PM10s often getting in excess of the WHO limit. And this generally coincides with noise measurement and other things showing it's associated with the peak machining activities. And if we look at the average levels here, if we look even in front of a machine, and you can see the increase from the tiniest particles to the largest particles and the red mark showing a sort of an average position, generally many values exceeding some of the standards for outdoor pollution, you can see they're often as high at the back of the machine as they are at the front of the machine. So in conclusion, what we're doing is recognizing that we have a complex etiology of this disease, a particular respiratory disease, and it needs a particular focus on reducing exposure. We have got improved tools to assess biohazards. I haven't talked about it, but we have improved methods now for looking at chemical hazards in metal working fluids. We can only do this in collaboration with different parties, including yourselves. We need more work to improve machine design and particularly looking at the extraction of mists. And we need to think carefully about how we understand why people become ill. And it may be about what they're individually doing, failures in a control mechanism, but the air monitoring is pointing to a larger issue of air quality and many more may be exposed. And we may therefore have to think about why some people become ill is because they predispose it in those circumstances to develop illness. I'll, I'll leave it there. Sorry, I've just run over a little bit. Thank you for that, Gareth. I'm just going to pass over to our second speaker, Howard, now. So, Howard, um, if you would be yeah. able to turn on your um, your camera, please, and then share your screen. Yeah. Do you want my camera on? Uh, we've got screen, no camera. Oh, camera's coming. There we go. We've got camera now. So, if you just full screen that presentation there, and you're good to go. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um. I'm, I'm going to talk very quickly today about um, land-based seafood processing in the UK. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll look at it from a, a number of perspectives. The, the ill health and the exposure to health pathways I'm looking at are these on this screen. And we're talking about allergen exposure. We're talking about Ig uh, mediated sensitization. And with a latent period, this can end up in immunological occupational asthma, or it could end up with occupational allergic rhinitis, although those first two might be on the same pathway. The latency period for these might be weeks, that'd be quick, it's usually months, and can run to years. And on the bottom of the slide is, is irritant exposure and ongoing exposure leading to non-immunological occupational asthma. So, so those are the pathways between exposure and health that I'm particularly interested in at the moment. If I'm going to take, I mean, if I was speaking to environmental health officers, you'd all be aware of the big 14 allergens, the Food Standards Agency on the right hand side, there's the 14. And actually four of those are pertinent, four of those 14 are pertinent to the seafood processing industry. That's namely crustaceans, and we probably all know what crustaceans are. Fish, we know what those are. Mollusks, which is a rag bag to me as a non-biologist, because it includes things like octopus, squid, as well as scallops, clams, can it increase land-based snails as well. Uh, and those are the three groups, major groups. And then you've got this other thing, which is sulfur dioxide, 
uh, and sulfites as, as preservatives and, and used in various aspects, which you also find in the Sui food industry. And, and the outcome, just thinking from that food perspective, is that they're, I mean, we, we're no longer hunter gatherers, you know, we're in the supermarkets looking in the, um, the, the shelving and the freezer cabinets. There must be a significant seafood processing sector that is supporting the retail and hospitality sectors producing these elements. And there is the potential for respiratory exposure to allergens during seafood processing. Staying on seafood and food allergies, um, one can see that the, the three classes we're looking at is, um, let's see if I can get rid of that. I'm seeing all myself, nothing else. The, the major allergens or the major allergenic protein in fish is parvalbumin. In shelf is tropomyosin. Also in mollusks is tropomyosin, although there are other ones that come in for some of the more weird types. Why are they major allergens? Well, because fish, if you're food allergic to fish, 95% uh, of cases, it's you raise specific IgE to parvalbumin, a similar big number across stage of atropomyosin. I won't go on much about the protein chemistry of them, but all of those, tropomyosin and parvalbumin, are involved in muscle contraction and relaxation. Uh, and actually, parvalbin is interesting because parvalbin is a major allergen, but it, it's very different between fish species and depending on what sort of muscle they have, such that in, in tuna, they have a very little of the particular parvalbumin isoform that causes the problems in comparison to something like uh, salmon. So tuna tends to be a less an allergic foodstuff than salmon would be. The, the thing to bear in mind is that, that both parvalbumin and tropomyosin are relatively stable. They survive cooking, they survive the gas, gas the, the, the acid in the gut, and that's why they end up as food allergens. But that actually might suggest why they'd be interesting respiratory allergens. I seem to have locked up here at the moment. Uh, Sorry about this. Um, we can then look at the literature on seafood processing. There have been a number of studies from the 2000 onwards, uh, and a number of views have been carried out. And if you look at the work from Jebe or, or Lapata, that they have given some very expert reviews of that area. But the literature they're looking at covers fishing, aquaculture, and land-based processing. And the ILO in uh, 2000 put the split between fishing at 52% and land-based processing at about 16%. Well, in the UK, that is probably reversed. Our fishing industry is relatively small, but our land-based processing industry is quite large relatively to those. And the one thing about the uh, literature, international literature, is very little of it comes from the UK. There's a lot on things like snow crabs over in Newfoundland and the States and other things. But specifically relating to the UK, there's a dearth of it, really. The international literature suggests that occupational asthma, the prevalence, is somewhere between 2 and 36%, depending on the populations you look. At, and it suggests that occupational asthma related to shellfish exposure is bigger than related to fish exposure. Other health outcomes that they, they uh, cover in the international literature is irritant-induced asthma, we'll come back to that later, and the dermal problems like contact urticaria and contact dermatitis. The international literature again talks about some of the processes that pose high risk due to the exposure you get from them. And again, one has to be cautious because how relevant are those processes to actually what's going on in the UK sector? The one thing we can all agree on is water is a prominent feature of the environment, 
and I do know that fish and shellfish live in water, I'm talking about the use of water in the actual processing mechanisms. We can all agree that major allergens are tropomycin parvalgans. There are quoted minor allergens, but there are other inflammatory agents. So Gareth has already mentioned endotoxin. There's a trypsin enzyme in fish, which can activate uh, various immunological pathways and chitin in shellfish. I'll come back to the, the, the stuff about dose response relationships in a minute. Let's just carry on. That risk factors, risk factors for being sensitized to, to seafood allergens. Really being atopic is an increased risk. So if you're, if you're the person who has multiple sensitivities to things, hay fever, things like that, you're also at increased risk of becoming allergic to fish and shellfish. Smoking is also a risk factor for sensitization to seafood allergens and the development of OA. And this really means, although I know in a regulatory context, uh, these are asthmogens, so in a regulatory context, we say that keep low exposure as low as possible. But if we're looking on a sort of scientific basis to say, what do we know about the dose response relationships? It's unclear because we might have multiple dose response relationships. The dose response relationship, the exposure response relationship for someone who is not sensitized to anything may be very well different to someone who's atopic. Again, the dose response relationship for uh, your endpoint of occupational asthma may be very different as well. So you have multiple dose response relationships. And the key point is almost all this international literature is based on cross-sectional studies, which are very, very difficult to tease out dose response relationships. This is maybe the one study, a UK study. It's old, it's from 1995. It's quite a good, reputable study, but it gives you some idea of the issues. Uh, to quickly take it through you, this, this study, it was a new plant, the salmon plant, started um, presumably before 1995 when it was published, probably 93 or something like that. 291 workers in it, quite a big plant. And within three months, you were getting about 8% uh, producing symptoms that looked like occupational asthma. Now, when you looked closer, when the authors looked very more closely against the symptom groups, 9% of this workforce, of 291 people, had pre-existing asthma. And that is very, very common in most health-based studies in not only this scenario, but all other scenarios. I'm an asthmatic myself, I still work. So you would, if you're doing a study, find a quite high prevalence of pre-existing asthma or other chronic obstructive um, diseases within the workforce. And then if you go through the symptom groups, 50% of this workforce had no symptoms, 17% had nasal symptoms, or upper respiratory tract symptoms largely, 60% had the more asthmatic type symptoms of wheeze, chest tightness, and 8% of them really did seem to have workplace related asthma. And you can see on the right hand side of this table, we have the positivity of specific IgE. And you can see, and although this method they used at this time was a little bit less sensitive than we use at the moment, there's a big increase in positivity of those they defined as asthmatic. Well, as an occupational study, this was a little bit more clever because they went back later on after ventilation had been improved. And the ventilation improved was by putting in LEV into the uh, uh, associated with the gut in washing machines, but also it was related to actually moving workforce around the department to actually try and uh, get people who had asthma away from point sources of the allergens. And actually, when they studied new joiners, when the new ventilation was in, only 3% of new workers showed any symptoms. 
and they were fairly mild symptoms. There were new, new, no new cases of IgE sensitization. And 46% of those asthma cases um, who'd already been um, defined as such with a new, um, new ventilation showed significant respiratory improvement and could continue at work. Unfortunately, that meant that actually 54% of this um, population actually could no longer work in this factory. IgE, the, the sensitivity of IgE was related to higher exposure and smoking status, but in this cross-sectional study, not to ATOPI status. Now, this is some work that was done with University of Manchester using their um, surveillance schemes, the THOR and the SWORD scheme. And this is SOAR data, where we look to see what the annual incidence rate of occupational asthma was in the seafood processing sector. And the period is 1992 to 2017. And the annual incidence rate was 24-fold higher than in all other industries. Um, the uh, mean was about 70 cases per 100,000 in the, in the sector with a confidence intervals of 14, 49 to 91. Now that's actually quite high. If you take the lower confidence interval of 49, that's roughly about the instance rate in bakers and bakeries over that same time period. So it suggests that it was substantial new cases of occupational asthma um, being produced in this um, sector. The main problem was when you came to chunk it down to time frames, all really Manchester could do was to look at the trend over time. And the trend over time in the uh, seafood processing sector seems similar to the trend in all other activities. So we couldn't take time chunks and try and define what, say, the, uh, the instance rate was over five year periods. The sector isn't just big enough to do that. Now, we know from the full data, I'm a non-expert on sword and full, full data, there may be someone listening who is, but the instant rate generally of occupational asthma is, was going down from, you know, around the late 1990s, early 2000s, towards 2014-ish, and then appears to have at least flattened off um, and it's possibly the same sort of thing as in, the, in this particular sector. I mean, one could pose the question is, was the decrease in occupational asthma generally seen related to the public health message about giving up smoking at the same time? Because we know smoking is a risk factor for occupational asthma. But the major question I come up with, and I'm a bit of a cynic, is, Okay, over that time period, 92 to 2017, there was a big instance rate of occupational asthma. But is it an historical issue? What is going on now? This is the uh, just a breakdown. Um, as you can see, the cases, and now these are as reported um, via the SWORD scheme, 50 52% of them related to shellfish, 38% of the cases related to fish, and 10% related to irritant type exposures. On the right hand side of the graph, you can see the agents that have been implicated. And of course, this comes from largely discussion between the physician and the case. And one wonders about how much strength one can put on these particular percentages. Uh, for shellfish, prawn seems a, a, a big number. Um, and on the right hand side for fish, salmon seems a big number. This is the current characteristics of the UK industry. It employs about 20,000 people uh, at the moment and about that's about 18,000 full-time equivalent people. Um, about 65% of the workforce are in units greater than uh, 100 staff. 
Uh, there's a lot of geographical spread. Obviously, units are spread around the, the countryside, but there's a big, big preponderance, a big sort of regional hubs around Hull and the Humberside in the Grampian region. There's about 350 different processing units, some small, some large, and the shift is towards the larger units. And that number is decreasing. So if we went five years ago, we'd have almost 400 units. We're now to 350 units. And the move has been towards larger units where secondary processing, including the production of ready-made meals, which in itself involves the addition of other food allergens than material, are becoming increasingly important. The other thing that's changed is that um, 30, 40 years ago, the landings of fish and shellfish were what drove where the industry was and what they did. But increasingly, imports are becoming important and particularly in the bigger units. There has also been a very significant change to the use of automation, particularly in the larger units where cost pressures are, are quite high. About 45% of the workforce is non-British, mostly from Poland and the Baltic states. And the reason for that is not because they're cheap labor, but because actually in those countries, they have formal qualifications in fish processing. So they're highly valued worker. There is also a high proportion of waste of primary material, anywhere between about 30 to 40% of the fish or shellfish is originally, you might call waste, but it's now byproducts where we try to find uses for it. And that includes things like shells, heads, skins, etc. You can divide processing into these various tasks. I mean, they're not clearly uh, mutually exclusive, but primary uh, processing, um, secondary processing, where actually now the value added is becoming very financially important, where there's a long effort, big emphasis going in. And then you've got finding uses that are uh, commercially useful for, for the end product. I won't drift on and start on this, stay on this slide very long, just to say it's a complex relationship between landings and imports. And if we just take a couple of these, if you look at salmon, uh, salmon is farmed largely in, almost invariably in Scotland, uh, 95,000 tonnes at the time of this graphic, this is about two or three years old, uh, was farmed in Scotland, but we imported something round about 80,000, largely from Norway. Um, that's because Scottish salmon is quite highly prized, lots of it goes for exports, and we then bring in Norwegian salmon to produce that in terms of processing. Now, the only reason I show that is because some of the import stuff will have had a degree of processing already gone on, done on it, whereas things like landings may need a lot of extra processing, including things like washing particularly for things like seafood, washing possibly with high pressure hoses. Um, this is just some slides from the industry. Um, and I'm, I'm thanking Andy Simpson for, for letting me abuse some of his slides. Uh, and these are just a flavor of the summer tasks that go on. Cutting and slicing goes along a lot. And on the top picture on the right, I, and I think Andy was very surprised, to see blocks of fish, like breeze blocks, being cut up by a bandsaw. I didn't think fish look like this, but this is an activity that goes on. There's a lot of automation for splitting, deboning, and filleting fish. It is enclosed, but you can see escapes of aerosols from it. Um, there's large scale automation for cutting and slicing and shellfish often crabs, but a lot of it is also done manually. In the smaller places, small handheld disc cutters are used for some workers from both manual fillet trimming and also on uh, lobster claws and, and shells. The use of water, I don't know whether you can see from those, those uh, two pictures on the right hand side, but you will see there's a great deal of spraying of product. Uh, with water. So an automated task, you know, spraying is relentless and continuous. 
and it does produce aerosols. And it presumably may well produce aerosols that have encapsulated some of the allergens themselves. On the top two photographs on the right hand side, you've got tray washing, which is an ongoing process because the fish and shellfish come in trays and those need to be cleaned, ready for the next use. Uh, on the very right hand side, you have someone using a, a, a hose system. Uh, how high pressure it is, I'm not quite sure. But there's the potential in all those tasks for producing aerosols. Um, there is within shift cleaning, it does involve some water use, but in the large units, what you find is you've got night shift cleaning done by specialist teams using chemical reagents, chemical agents. I just wanted to show you some of the automation in places you might find. If you look at the top right, this is a system where uh, gutted salmon are um, dragged into this big cabin on the left-hand side on, a, on an ongoing um, conveyor-based system. So on the right-hand side, the, this conveyor-belt system is, is, is ongoing, it's fed continuously. The salmon go into this big cabin on the top left, where their heads are cut off automatically, sucked by vacuum for other uses. They're split down the middle. The main spine and most of the bones are removed. And then they come out the other end where the two people on the end are probably just doing a little bit of minor trimming. It then goes down the line where there is be a station which it does pin boning, which is a manual technique where someone has to ensure that all the small little bones are removed. You then might go to a further station where you have a portioner, which might be a laser controlled cutting device to actually make sure that every fillet or every salmon steak is 142 grams. And then it might move on to an automated packing station. But as you can see by the bottom left hand side, and that shows pin by, there's a lot of water going on. On the bottom right hand side, I'm just showing how prawns are deshelled. Now, uh, and they are cooked first of all, and I'm not showing a cooking process, but they go onto this roller system, which rotate, and in fact, the meat is squeezed off from the shells, and the shells are then squeeze, uh, are then removed from this roller system by either jets of water or even air jets. So again, there is the possibility in these systems for the production of aerosols. And you can get, you know, that's quite a big system you're, you're looking at on the bottom right. And behind that, you'd have an automatic continuous cooking system. And to the right of it, you'd have an automatic grading system. But you can get smaller units, that, smaller parts of that, which smaller units could be using. Quickly, I'll move on to measurement. Um, now, we've developed a number of measures for the major allergens. Um, we have um, assays that cover prawn, shrimp, scampi, uh, crab, lobster. On the right, parvalvin, cod, paragot, and safe, coli. Um, you have to use a completely separate one for parvalvin for salmon and trout because salmon and trout, uh, the parvalvin, is distinctly different to those you find in whitefish. I got Alaskan Pollock there because uh, I don't know where Stephanie Carter is with us, but uh, she's been doing some on vessel work. And originally we thought we could have part of albumin as part of the cod panel, but actually it's far better to separate it. Alaskan Pollock is close to the family of cod, but not quite as close as to make it easy to use the same assay. So one has competitive non uh, non competitive immunoassays available to measure these things. Um, they're fairly sensitive, you can use them. And this is, I'm just showing some data here that we collected at HSE. Uh, and if Stephanie's there, I do apologize, Stephanie, without your permission, I just bunged your last batch of pollock acids down there to give a comparison for on, uh, on vessel sampling. Uh, what you've got there on the top half of the slide is um, airborne tropomyosin results showing you the median results, the range, the interquartile range. 
largely these are from actual samples submitted to HSC in turn by, by standard occupational hygienists. A few of the early uh, samples came via um, some targeted HSE um, site visits when it was quite interested in the use of high pressure jets in the early 2000s. But as you can see, there is a range of numbers and some of them go to be very high. But if we just drop down to, to the salmon results at the bottom, uh, that's where we've got, we've only got 52 UK salmon results, which gives you a range between 0 to 816 nanograms per meter cubed. But if you compare it with um, Stephanie's heroic efforts at doing on vessel sampling for Pollock, you'll see very large numbers compared to on land, land based um, processing. We then took the tropomyosin, this is ongoing work, tropomyosin measurements, and we tried to begrade them, begrade, begrade them by the tasks that are being undertaken. Um, you will have their the top of the side blowing, blowing automated, blowing manual. Largely, that reflects to actually getting meat out of the claws and legs of crabs. But there are a couple of other areas where blowing techniques are used. And as you can see, if you just run your eyes down the median numbers, blowing is an activity that can produce high numbers. And if you go down the list, you'll see that some of the other numbers are smaller. Uh, washing, which refers to both hosing down floors and also tray washing, you'll see there are relatively higher numbers. Scoring and slicing really relates largely to people using small electric disc cutters to actually do fancy cuts on crab claws or to get into shells of various things. Uh, and they do seem to produce significant exposures. And I'll just summarize now, um, because we're probably running out of time. Fish crustacean mollusks are major causes of food allergy, and they can also during processing for food for edible nature, pose an allergic risk to workers. The major food allergens, being trypomyosin parvalvian, are also major respiratory allergens. And we have this data that the UK seafood pressing sector has had a high incidence, certainly up to 2017, from on that period, from 92 to 2017. But really, I have to stand back and say, well, I'm not quite sure. I under know, I now know what the risk of allergic disease is at the current state of the industry as it undergoes these quite considerable changes. Um, obviously, the key to, to um, reducing the risk of occupational or allergic diseases is, is controlling and reducing allergen exposure. And there, I think there are roles for the measurement of airborne allergen both in identifying riskier tasks and trying to benchmark what the effects of workplace modifications are. But I think I'll, set, I'll stop there because I think we've uh, more or less run out of time. Excellent, thank you, Howard. Um, so yeah, so as we mentioned at the beginning, um, if you have any questions for either of our panelists today, just start sending them in. Uh, so we'll give um, give everyone a couple of minutes just to to submit any questions, and then uh, Mary will run through them. Yes, I, I haven't seen any technical questions come in, but yeah, if we just give it say a minute, if you have any burning questions, just chuck them in really quick, and then um, we have ten minutes left, and we can we can go through them. Um, in the meantime, thank you both so much. That was excellent, very thorough. If we don't get any questions in it, because it's because you covered everything. You just we it was so well done. It was just covered absolutely everything there. Um, I thought they were both quite technical, but presented in a very easy to understand way. So thank you. That was really well done. Really flowed very well. Um, and thank you for taking the time out as well to to go through this. Really appreciated. Um, so we just hold on a minute. Here we go. We have one in. Okay, this one is for Howard. 
Uh, how do you see the significance of pre-employment screening for at-risk individuals? Oh. Mm -hmm. So I'll start in a personal capacity rather than an HSE capacity. Um, I, I think it's difficult. I mean, I, I think the data we say about um, your pre-existing atopy status or, or your level of uh, multiple IG sensitization, I, I, I wouldn't want to bar people from entering the industry at all. Uh, and I think the data we're basing, as I say, is cross-sectional and it, it is a bit difficult. Obviously, I think if you're taking on people who have pre-existing asthma, you might want to actually consider whether they need increased surveillance in terms of health surveillance than, than people who are unrelated. And of course, most of these industries, as we're talking about aspirin, should have some form of health surveillance in place. So pre-employment, I'm, I'm not that bothered about. I'm more bothered about that we have the appropriate health surveillance in place in those places going forward, I think. All right, thank you very much. Um, we'll go on to, oh gosh, oh there you are, okay, sorry, <laughs> my screen froze for a sec. Uh, we'll go on to Gareth next. Uh, so here's one for, for you. Uh, so for metal working fluid with boron no longer useful as a marker, what, um, what is the best sample suite for metal working fluid? Sorry, could you repeat that? Oh, sorry. Uh, so for metal working fluid with boron no longer useful as a marker, what would be the best sample suite for, for um, metal working fluid? Yeah, so I think this is where we have to acknowledge that there is a gap missing. Um, and often we have conversations with lots of people about this without there being, um, you know, a, a benchmark to judge good practice against with the pressures on the boron based marker. So part of our research is going to be doing more work and we had hoped, it's unfortunately COVID has prevented by now, to have held a workshop where we would start discussing with a whole range of experts in analytical method methodology and the existing methods that other countries use about whether we either need to consider looking at alternatives to boron or the use of an existing international method. The concern we have, and Andrew, who I think is participating, was very much involved, Andrew Simpson, in the early days of the development of the boron-based marker, it is a very good analytical marker method. And um, one would reluctantly move away from it, but the pressure with reduced use of boron, and we know far fewer people use the boron-based method, it has raised difficulty. Um, so one or two things, I won't go into too much detail. This has been discussed in the alternatives in a paper that Sam Lord and Paul Smith wrote for the BOHS magazine. And if we could perhaps circulate that to people as part of the answers, if you haven't seen it already, in terms of some sort of intermediate advice, that is that if companies are sort of in-house benchmark setting, uh, decide to use one of the other international methods, in principle, that might help them move forward, um, but they obviously will need to bear in mind, um, you know, in terms of how they apply that methodology and following the uh, published methodology that's appropriate for that. One of the reasons we started to look at the use of direct reading aerosol monitors, um, you could argue it's not a fix, but it is an intermediary position that can at least encourage and allow people to start looking at sources of emissions and do something about it. And so that's one of the things that's developing as an approach alongside encouraging the use of backlighting and say smoke pencil, smoke generators to look at leak source. So our focus at the moment, it's not ideal, is to put practical measures in place for people to identify where they have problems with emissions and act quickly to do something about those. I think in terms of the future of an analytical marker, I won't go into that. We have had discussions with colleagues. As an example, one thing that's been put forward by some of the chemists is that you might ideally want to put in a specific marker into metalworking fluids. And from an analytical point of view, if you could identify such a marker, 
it would make it so much easier if you had a standard marker. The difficulty is in terms of all the validation that a metalworking fluid has to go through, which can take years, and particularly for big companies, aerospace companies, what they require their suppliers to do in terms of conforming to use for particular certified lubricants means you'd have to have a very, very long discussion before even adding something that could be harmless but as a marker. So that needs a lot of careful thinking, which is why what we're hoping to do when we get through COVID is to start a workshop like we've done for the use of DRAMs, like we've done for the use of compressed airlines, to bring groups of experts to consider what the possibilities are. But in the meanwhile, what I would refer to people is the advice that Sam and Paul have put forward in the BOHS magazine. So I'm sorry I can't be more specific than that, but as a general principle, uh, if companies need to, Sam and Paul's articles outline a strategy that you could follow for in-house. What we're also trying to say is if you haven't thought about this, there are some other approaches, uh, and that's published and outlined in the DRAM research report that you can consider that don't leave you, shall I say, completely in the dark, that should allow you to take actions to try and reduce exposure to metalworking fluids. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, one for you, Howard. So here we has microbial exposure from seafood processing been investigated? So is that micro microbial? Microbial. So that's strange. Yeah. Um, microbial. Yeah, in a, in a very marginal way, not in the UK. Um, I would ha I would have to go and look at the the, the, the source material, um, whether it be relevant. I mean, a lot of lot of the um, studies that have been published in international literature come from fairly hot climates, where you may get some degradation, some change in the in the microbial growth. So in the UK, I don't think we have a lot of information, really. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. Uh, another one for Garrett. Would you expect a LEV text on a CNC machine to include partic particle countermeasurements, or uh, Tyndall illumination is a t is Tyndall illumination enough? <laughs> I, I'm not really the best person because I'm not the LEV expert. All I would say is in terms of our workshop to discuss that, um, a good place to start if you don't have access and you haven't, you know, it's expensive, say, to use a particle counter, would be to use those methods, the simpler methods, like backlighting, uh, like using, say, a smoke source to identify where there are potential sources. So it's a good place to start, and particularly suited to small companies. The particulate measurement can help. It's a little bit more sort of quantitative if you do it as a before and after, but not truly quantitative. It's very difficult. So when we ran the workshop, we had colleagues from a very large organization that had run a survey for using DRAMs alongside the other methods. And what they found is, is that naturally, when you start to try and make comparisons based upon using particle counters between machines, between different workshops, you will get very different results. And it's very difficult to tie that down in a truly quantitative way. On the other hand, if you were you had some concerns about a filter and you replace a filter and you do a before and after comparison, it can come give you some confidence that you are reducing uh, respirable inhalable particles as a consequence of actions that you've taken. So there's some things like that that you can do. Um, but I'm not certain, I'm not the person to really answer in terms of uh, what would be necessary to uh, record, you know, in terms of LEV, you know, providing assurance about the function of the LEV. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. One for you, Howard. Uh, histamine is associated with food poisoning from fish, but this was not mentioned here. Does exposure to histamine not occur during food processing? I think probably in the UK, probably not. Um, but I haven't seen a lot of data. I mean, histamine from from food spoilage, from fish spoilage, is well known. Um, but in fact, the the UK sector is a takes its food hygiene regulations very very 
seriously. And the food hygiene in the seafood processing sector is very, very tight. And I suspect things like histamine and spoilage would be within the food hygiene regulation rather than the occupational hygiene. There may well be data there. All I can largely say is that, I mean, these places, most of them, particularly the large ones, are scrupulously clean and very high throughput, which means that spoilage is probably unlikely, but I wouldn't say it didn't happen. Okay. Thank you both very much. Well, we're out of questions and we're out of time, so perfect timing. Thank you, um, everybody, for joining us, for listening in. Thank you again to the presenters. Very well done, very thorough, uh, both excellent presentations. And until next time, if if you, I'm sure you guys have seen the email go out, but there is a uh, London and Southeast region is ho hosting their own webinar on the 25th of November on topic of welding. So if you are interested, please do sign up for that as well. And Thank you both again. Um, these, the PDFs for the presentations will be available as well as the recording for the, for the webinar will be sent, uh, sent out to you all. So thanks everybody and until next time. Excellent. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you very much. Hmm.